I'm so excited because today we have two super special, amazing guests, and we met them, well, one of them, at a CRA event a couple of years ago. That was Jennifer Otiano, and she introduced us to one of her friends, who you'll get to meet in a second, but I'm going to introduce Jennifer. Jennifer is from Lagos, Nigeria, originally. She was born there and then raised in Boston in the Roxbury area. She's currently a PhD student in information science at Cornell University and has a bachelor's of science in biological sciences from Wellesley College. She's really interested in human AI interaction and her work has been generously supported by the National Gym Consortium and the Mellon Foundation. Recently, an abstract that she submitted for a work in progress paper on understanding online identity management strategies of black queer folks, which is the tentative title, um, was submitted as a part of a proposed panel, which is headed by Meredith Clark. It was accepted by the Critical Approaches to Black Media Culture Conference, and that was recently held in New Orleans, Louisiana. In her spare time, she loves metalsmith jewelry, traveling, yeah. and writing, which includes blogging, poetry, and even a speculative fiction novella. She's also interned at MIT Lincoln Labs. I'll hand it over to Kyla so she can introduce our other guest. Yes, we have Koei Kadoma, who hails from Twin Cities, so Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota. She's also a PhD student in information science education at Cornell Tech. She has a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering from Florida A&M, or FAMU, as many of you know it as. Um, her work focuses on human computer interaction and AI ethics. She's been supported by the Jim Fellowship and DLI Fellowship. She uses mixed methods to understand how AI practitioners incorporate ethical principles into their work and develop evaluation frameworks and design interventions to create equitable experiences for users of, users of language technologies. She's interned in the past at Uber, Medtronic, and Jenner and Block. So we are so happy to have you all with us today. Happy to be here. Yes, Aww. thank you for having us here. <laughs> we need to sound, we need, we need a little more convincing. <laughs> I know, I don't <laughs> seem excited. <laughs> no, I'm shy, but I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're really excited. And I think Jennifer is a, a long time listener of the podcast and was really excited to meet us at CRAWP. We were in a hallway um, kind of doing our thing, recording people live. And we got a little snippet from her while we were there yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. How was that? It was so cool seeing you guys. <laughs> it was so cool seeing you guys. Like I said, yeah. Aww. Um, I just I saw you guys and I just felt like a little kid. I was like, oh my gosh. I <laughs> I was just Aww. like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe it. I'm seeing other <laughs> like black women in academia. Like I think I just get like starry eyed whenever I see them Aww. in the same space. So I like just felt like I gravitated to you guys to just like at least say something and say hi. And to like introduce myself a bit, so cool. Um, discovering you guys there, really. So, and I, I at the moment, I didn't really feel ready at that point mm -hmm. to talk, but like a year later, I feel a little bit better, <laughs> and I'm glad that we were able to find time. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you came up and chatted with us, and we could make this happen today. Mm hmm. Yes. Okay. So when we okay. emailed Jennifer, she was like, I have a friend who's yes. also going through this journey with me. And, you know, Kyla and I are all about like mentorship. I would say she's a near peer mentor of mine, even though she's like a rock star. And I'm just like an understudy in the back on the Whatever. corner. Jeremy looking runs at, the show. Looking at the edge. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say like, I love that you were like, I want my friend to be a part of this too. So, Koe, thank you for accepting our invitation to be here with us. Koe has been such a 
important part of my journey here like oh. through a phd program and at cornell like she's one of the greatest people i've ever met in Aww. this lifetime oh. you know and so like i wanted to have the experience of doing this with her so we All always right. start out by asking our guests about what it was like for them growing up what were their early influences in technology if any so Let's see. We'll start with Jennifer. What was it like growing up in Boston? Mm, I think for me, well, one, uh, for most of my experience, I went, I attended a Catholic school in Boston. Um, and so a lot of my experience was around like religion and growing up, um, Catholic and participating um, in the church in some some way, um, but outside of that, I was really a quiet, sense artistic kid, and so I just spent much of my time reading and mm. like uh, I'm from a like very protective immigrant family, so. <laughs> I kind of just like escaped into like my own inner world. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's, that's really what it was like for me growing up in Boston. Mm. Um, just a lot of reading and exploring my interests in the world through like the internet. And I think that's really what probably started this like lifelong interest in um, the internet, social media platforms, and technology was just because it just seemed like a gateway into like the wider world. Um, and it had an impact on how I was able to like socialize, what I was able to learn. And so I think that's kind of what jump started my interest in the aspect of my current research. Hmm, interesting. That's cool. What about you, Jennifer? What was it like in the totally. Twin Cities? <laughs> Koei. Oh, Koei. oh yeah. we're going to say it again, Robin. <laughs> okay. What about you, Koei? What was it like growing up in the Twin Cities? Yeah. So like Jen, um, my parents are also immigrants. Uh, my family's from Uganda. And so mm -hmm. they were always pushing me and my siblings to be really high achievers. And so I always knew that uh, going to grad school was something I was going to do. Um, my dad has a PhD and my grandfather has an MD PhD. So like they had gone through their own similar journey. Um, and I always liked tinkering and building things. Um, so I knew I wanted to do some sort of engineering. Um, but it wasn't until around like high school that I started thinking about computer science and computer engineering a lot more. Um, mostly kind of like Jen, I was spending a lot of time online and um, people would be like developing websites in their free time and doing all these really cool projects. So I started to um, started to follow suit. Nice. Hmm. So were you like tinkering and doing things like that at home, either of you? Because it sounds like reading was a huge draw, yeah. but... That is very unconventional when I think of people who end up in engineering mm. or technology. For me, yeah, I think the extent of my tinkering was mostly with, so I, so I remember being on one of these like online, so like these websites, mm -hmm. um, it was called Horse. So people would like come together and just like, have like a pretend horse that would take care of and whatnot but I <laughs> so like drew me was that they would have like these like there were people who would like make money by making websites or like web pages for people so people could like stylize their pages and so that kind of like made me interested in at least coding mm -hmm. um seeing like how people built pages and like css and stuff like hc um html so that was, I think, the extent of like my tinkering with these web pages and like how I wanted things to look and stuff like that. So th that was like an un like the introduction to um, technologies I would later go much deeper into later on um, in college. So yeah, and I think it was interesting because 
I like that you brought up that you kind of knew that you're going to be in a PhD. I honestly did not know <laughs> I was going to be in a PhD. Um, I guess like it was ex- well, it was expected that I was going to be a doctor, but I was just like in my head as a kid, I was like, "You're joking," <laughs> you know, <laughs> like can't be for real. Um, they wanted to be wanted me to be a medical doctor, and oh, wow. so. But that wasn't really something I had internalized and I had, you know, I had um, my undergrad degree was in biological sciences. So I was taking steps to being a doctor, but I realized I didn't like it. And Mm -hmm. so like I pivoted and I kind of returned to those like early interests that I had as a kid, like these building the websites using these like online technologies. Like I actually attended this, um, this website building workshop at HubSpot. And I think that's what really pushed me to like return back to what ha- what I had enjoyed in my childhood. Um, and then I ended up here. Wow. <laughs> so was this, this was during college that you did the, the website um, workshop. Yeah, it was in college. Um, it had been such a long time since I had like done anything like that. Mm-hmm. And then I was just like, huh, I actually like doing this. <laughs> and then I just kept on doing it. <laughs> and then I, like my interest expanded, of course, but I think it was like that thing that encouraged me to take those steps. Okay. Well, Koi, okay. what, um, for you, you, did you always start off computer engineering or were there other interests that you had and you kind of found your way into computer engineering at FAM? Yeah. So in high school, I was spending a lot of time on these online communities and like people were, people were building um, their web pages. So I started dabbling in coding a little bit. But up until then, I had always seen myself as doing like mechanical engineering. I never really considered computer science. Um, yeah, but I also want to be a lawyer, so <laughs> <laughs> which is um, an interesting story. But um, when I was interning at this law firm, uh, Schwegman Lundberg and Wessner, which is an IP boutique in Minneapolis. Uh, they were like, you should do computer engineering because it's like double majoring in computer science and electrical engineering. And Mm -hmm. you have, um, you know, a breadth of experience. And so you can work on more legal matters than somebody who had just done mechanical engineering. So that's really what pushed me to get into computer engineering. And uh, yeah, I stuck with it. And you can always return, not return, but like be involved in the law route as well. Um, I have no interest in law, but (laughs) once you get your PhD, uh, you can be an expert witness for cases that involve computer engineering, computer science, electrical engineering. That's something I kind of stumbled into uh, over the past year. And it's been a lot of fun. I was like, oh, I had no idea this other world really? was trying. Mm-hmm. And you set your rate. So what yeah. is this? So X-ray what? is like, <laughs> uh, so mine was also, uh, it was you, I'm, to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Like you can, She's you taking can be notes, an everybody. Yes, She's taking she, notes. she has out her imaginary <laughs> writing pad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so i got a call from someone they're like large company a is being sued by small company for infringing on their patent on this on this large company's piece of technology so we need you to tell us does it really do that so you get to go in and say well actually what they're doing here is this what this patent actually says is this so like helping one side to defend themselves against the other so um but yeah it was really cool i have no (laughs) idea how they found me honestly i have no clue how they found me but there are expert witness uh websites where you can put in like your expertise and you know people law firms can contact you but yeah i was gonna say if you want to ever pivot back into that law area they were like oh you can read code okay well we're gonna we have code sometimes we need people to read so (laughs) you know and that and also that you know being a good person to work with be someone that's easy to work with that's responsive and they'll keep calling you to to do stuff so yeah and you can do that with the phd because you are a subject matter expert yeah after my phd i'll go to law school and i'll be a patent attorney i just i think i have so many interests and i have a fear of like 
being pigeonholed. So I don't see myself having one career. Like I'll be a research scientist. I'll be a patent attorney. So you can do it all. She's yeah. the Shima. <laughs> yeah, we have someone we have you need to talk to. Yeah, we have a friend who's engineer, lawyer, real estate. Oh, <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> she just finished her tests for another state like today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. So yeah. She celebrated with Chick-fil-A ice cream, which I'm not against. <laughs> so, you know, you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Yep. Well, cool. So you're mm -hmm. in college, you're exploring, you're figuring out things that you like and dislike. What were some things that were kind of pivotal f to make you want to pursue a, a, a research direction? Like what were the things that were like, I need a PhD? Because it's not mm. like everybody just decides to go and get a PhD. Yeah, well, I guess for me, because of my dad and my grandfather, and also my mom, who uh, really wanted to do a PhD, but wasn't able to, it was something that I was pushed towards and also wanted to do myself. So my first semester of college, I went to a professor in the department, and I was like, hey, I'm really interested in doing research. And uh, she's like, no, you're not quite ready yet. I usually recruit people who are in their junior year, but like, let's keep in touch. And um, so I did get in touch with her junior year and she recommended me for a scholarship and I started to do a little bit of research through there. Um, but yeah, I was very intentional in undergrad of like, I need to get research experience. I need to get letters of recommendation because I'm going to grad school. Mm -hmm. So were you part of any like program that like encouraged you to do that? Or you were just like, look, my dad and my grandpa, you know, these things are laid <laughs> out, you know, there is a trajectory to get from point A to point B. Or do you have any like scaffolding from anyone at the university? It was pretty much self-driven. Mm. Wow. That's did people know? Like, did you like vocalize that, that was what you wanted to do? Go to grad school? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I told her that like I wanted to go to grad school and she was very supportive. <laughs> yeah, we ask, we're asking you because it's like very rare to meet an undergraduate student who's like coming in on the first day, like, all right, I'm going to grad school. I need to work in your lab. <laughs> it's my personal <laughs> statement. Like, it's very rare to meet people that already know the path. Usually that's part of the hidden curriculum that we call it, you know, about how to how to do that. But you're like, all right, I'm already here. Let's do it. Where's the I research? don't need your program. Yeah. I don't need your little money. I got a plan. That's amazing. Yeah. What about you, Jennifer? Um, <laughs> what was the question? Like, what re what led you towards, like, I know you had influence from your family, but like, what led you towards, like, and now I'm going to apply for a PhD at Cornell. I'm going to do all these, you know, like, how did you, you didn't just stumble there. Like <laughs> you had to do some things to prepare yourself and get ready uh, to get there. Yeah. So after the HubSpot thing, I was pretty much like, okay, I want to keep on doing this mm. or something similar to it. So I started looking, I saw this opportunity for the summer science research program at my undergrad. Uh, and I looked within the CS department um, to see if there were any opportunities that could kind of align with where I was currently at as a um, biology student with interests, with particular interest and concentration in genetic um, in genetics cancer genomics. Um, and I found that this particular lab called the Human Computer Interaction Lab was doing projects related to like um, using technology um, to, to teach um, topics within biology. So I thought that that seemed like it could be a viable bridge from me as a bio, um, as a biologist biology student um, to be more within um, tech um, besides like entering like biotechnology. Uh, so I applied, I got in, I spent a summer in the lab, I worked on projects. And while I was there, I, you know, I built connections with other students in the lab. I um, built connections with the mentors, the people who were working there, 
um, and carrying out and leading projects within the lab as well. And um, the professor who also led the lab, Irby Shear of, of Wellesley College. And I think that after that summer, I stayed with the lab, but I continued doing work with them on projects. And so I just kept to that path. It was moving in a way, it was moving forward for me in a way that biology just wasn't. Like I didn't really see mm. a future for myself in biology. And so, and also I was, I found it difficult to find mentors in biology as well. And what was offered to me through this, like the human computer interaction lab was that those mentorships um, that eventually encouraged me to apply to a PhD program. So um, being able to work on different pro um, projects, build those credentials that I needed to apply. Um, it this seemed like if this felt like a, it felt like the most efficient way to getting to uh, to the future that I wanted for myself. So I just I just kept going. And I was just really encouraged by this like one professor really to do it. And so I did. I love that. Yes. So when you were thinking about grad school for both of you, did you always know where you wanted to land or did you apply to a bunch of different places? Yes. Or... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I did. Nice. So you were, did you only apply to one place and you're like, look, if I don't get in there, I'm not going. Or do you have some backup uh, schools? No. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I'm um, going to Cornell and that's it. And that's it. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I actually, I remember I went to this, um, to this um, conference um, with the Human Computer Interaction Lab and I saw, okay, so I saw like this piece of paper that had fallen on the floor and it was like the, um, what's it called? Like when like professionals have like those little cards. Business cards? cards? Business cards, yeah. I saw a business <laughs> card and it was like from someone from Cornell, um, Corn like Cornell. Um, I forget the name of the professor, but she did something related to um, fabrication mm -hmm. tech. And I look, I Googled her, I looked at her work and I thought like, oh, this is so cool. Is this wow. what they're doing at Cornell? I want to be there. And then two years later, after that moment, <laughs> I was just like, like, I knew I was going to, I knew I was going to be there. So I like kind of like just planned for the next two years. Like, yeah, I'm just going to get everything ready to apply to Cornell. And then I got in and it was really the only PhD program that I applied to. Wow. And then I got Amazing. <laughs> You that is so rare to hear. So Cohen's so rare. face is like absolute <laughs> shock right now. Like what? <laughs> yeah, because I applied to like ten programs. I got into three. <laughs> um, I guess when you know, you know. I, I was the Lulu. <laughs> I was very say, don't don't do say. don't do what I did. I was just Lulu <laughs> and arrogant. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, it worked. Like I didn't really have like yeah, so I didn't really have a thing that was like, oh, they could reject me. <laughs> That's crazy. Like they have a choice. What? Like they have a, <laughs> like I just didn't have that at that moment. And then when I got I was like, oh wow. Like they could have said no. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that. So um yeah, that's what happened for me. That is amazing. I'm like crying because that is just so funny to <laughs> me. Like just one school and then that's it. I mean, I did the same thing, but for different reasons. Like, I was like, I don't feel well, so this is all I got. So I'm going to submit this application and mm -hmm. keep it moving. But, yeah, not to a school that yeah. I didn't know anybody. Man, that's that's huge. Ooh, mm. Okay, so did you both start at the same time? Yeah, we're in the same cohort. Oh, oh I love that. That's cute. That's so cute. Okay. <laughs> and then you're at different campuses now, right? Yes. Okay. So we, there's yes, some stories but... that we're missing. We need the details yeah. to fill in these gaps. So listen, well, you got accepted first year, and then. <laughs> oh. 
I was gonna, t- Kawe, I was gonna be like, oh, remember that moment where we took a class together and we were both too shy to talk yes. to each other? <laughs> oh. Are you both introverts? I am. Yeah. So please yeah. tell us how two introverts met because as an extrovert, Jeremy and myself, as two extroverts, right? We it was we easy just for meet us. people. Yeah, I, I had no idea introverts ever met each other. So yeah, please. I invited myself to Kyla's dinner. <laughs> yes, uninvited and just showed up, and I was like, "Ooh, I like her. We're yeah, friends." I was now. like, "Yeah, we. That's my friend." <laughs> okay, oh, I wait, feel like take it away. No, I feel like during orientation, like I would see you around and I was just like, oh, she seems cool. And then I didn't talk to you. Um, And then (laughs) I had the same thought. (laughs) And then we're in the same class our first semester. And I think you would sit like right behind me. And and then I still didn't talk to you unless it was like a group activity. Uh, I also didn't talk to you. Yeah. I thought you were cool. (laughs) This Um, is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, but it wasn't until um, we had like this, um, like all the black women in the department had like this little online chat happy hour thing. And then you were also there. And that's when I started talking to you more. Um, But that was like a year later. Wow. Yeah. And then I think at that point, I, I don't, I don't, I really don't know what's the thing but even though like I'm I think maybe I have the slightly more outgoingness so I figured I liked I was like I like Koe I like talking to her so I was just like do you want to co-work together and then we Uh and I have like a I have like a um, calendar invite that's like (laughs) Ko like K O, the beginnings of her name W, working. <laughs> um, and so like we just like kept meeting weekly and just talking about our research, and that continued for like a year or so. And Aww. then we just like slowly built um the connection, and then we both realized that we were hilarious. Um, <laughs> and then that made things even better. So yeah. I will say introverts have a, a much a more interesting Slower. perspective of yes. what's going on in the world than extroverts do because we just say what we think, right? But you're constantly absorbing information. And then when you finally choose to release said information, it's like all of these things combined into a thought. It's beautiful. Um. <laughs> Also terrifying. Oh, I'm so glad you think that. Some people think it's <laughs> it has when it comes out. <laughs> it could be a, it could be a lot. Okay, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. But, it. but when introverts decide that they have made a friend, that is their friend for real. Like they don't mm. make these extraneous sorts of folks to kind of just hang on. It's like if I'm letting you inside my introverted world, you mean something to me. So, and I, I appreciate that. Like I have a friend who's very much an introvert. And like when I moved here, she knew I moved here. I did not know she lived here. She ran into me at the gym where we saw each other. I didn't see her because I was in the front and she was in the back. And so she saw me sitting down, like we were at a gym and a workout class and I was sitting down and she said she walked to her car because she's like, oh, there goes Kyla anyway. And she just walked to her car. (laughs) And then she was like, something told her, go back inside and say hello to her. (laughs) You know who she is. Because we have met in grad school and then, you know, it was just funny. And now, you know, I see her all the time. So mm-hmm, <laughs> she mm-hmm. was in my wedding. Like, I see her all the time. I <laughs> am. So oh, I am a thousand percent that person. Like, <laughs> I'll walk past somebody I know and I'm like, I should go say hi. <laughs> this is so funny to me. Oh, yeah. Okay. So we got past introvert land yeah. and we're in the wonderful bliss of friendship in grad school uh how was that Mm -hmm. yeah how was the school part of grad school oof Uh, i would (laughs) (laughs) i would say the first two years were a huge learning curve (laughs) Mm. but now it's year three i'm starting to piece things together it's going a lot more smoothly but the first two years were a lot just of how to 
I guess how to independently do research because mm. prior to grad school, it's like you're assigned a project. So all you have to do is execute. But now that I'm actually designing my own studies, it's just, there's so many things I had to consider that I hadn't thought of before. Um, and lots of going and presenting, which I don't particularly care for as an introvert and getting good feedback and incorporating that into my work. So it was, it, it took me a while to get used to it and to get comfortable doing it. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Yeah. The first few years were really intense, um, for different reasons. Um, well, you, you I transitioned remember, okay. from, uh, like core science right like yeah. a hard science to a grad program in technology not even just like like how did you get up to speed like that's that's a lot i don't i, I think i'm still not up to speed low mm. key okay high key um i feel that i am always trying my best to like keep abreast of what is happening. I think also I've just been like kind of lucky in that um, when I first, okay, when I first came, mm -hmm. I actually pivoted also on top of what my interests were. And I remember taking a class and I applied, and I, I, yeah, I remember taking a class with a professor uh, governing human AI, like behavior. Uh, and I thought it was super interesting and I think the first class or so, I like went to the professor and I was, or even before the class, I just like went to him and I was like, here's some research I've been working on from a different class that might be applicable to this. And also here's this book that I'm working on, blah, blah, blah. And like, I took the class and then he was like, actually, I thought what you're, the way you think is cool, let's work together. And I'm like, oh, nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, I think it's sometimes like just due to those coincidences or mm -hmm. that have that has made the process more bearable has been looking for people who value the way I think and don't mind that I'm someone who is a bit dynamic and constantly wanting to evolve and learn new things because like sometimes I think like one strategy someone has communicated to me is that, you know, when you apply to a program, they know you as the thing you do. And that's the thing you should continue doing, you mm. know, but like, for me, I think I kind of, this is something probably <clears throat> me and Koei share is that we hate being pigeonholed into like one thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that just wasn't going to work for me. And just finding people who are fine with that, that I'm going to change and it's not going to look linear and predictable. Um, so yeah, that has come with a, of like, like a huge learning curve. Um, not know anything about before really. Um, and just being able and willing to ask people for help to catch me mm -hmm. to speed as well, talking to a lot of my colleagues about what they knew about and learning from them. So it's just, <laughs> I feel like it's been really intense in that way. Um, so I'm always just constantly learning a lot. And I have, I've had to become like very comfortable with what has felt like failure to me. Mm -hmm. um, and moving at a pace that doesn't seem equivalent to other people because it's hard to not compare myself to other people and where they're at and, and their PhD journey, you know? And sometimes I look at them like, damn, maybe I should have stayed to like that one thing and should have just like kept myself in that hole. Mm -mm. So I would have been no more ahead of where I am now and not have explored any of the cool things that I'm doing now or even like, you know, or also just learning about like my own biases and preconceptions of what it meant to be an academic. I'm not sure if I would have like learned those things had I stayed on that path before, but yeah, it's been a lot of, it's been sh a struggle for sure. Um, but it I think it's been like, really meaningful. It sounds like it's been a lot of growth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like 
Growing is hard. If we think about like Mm -hmm. physically, like biology major, if we think about like (laughs) our bodies when they're transitioning from like adolescence to adulthood and like the pains that come with that, right? Like it's not an easy transition. And I think you're at one of those transition points. Graduate school is not for the faint of heart. That's why I tell people like you don't just get a PhD, especially (laughs) in like computing, technology, engineering. Like those aren't spaces where you just la la la. I'm just going to check some boxes and I'm going to go to these classes and and do these grades. I'm going to do this research. And now I got a PhD. Woo! Like, no, it's not like that. (laughs) Yeah, I would say another thing that made it so difficult is just the pace at which everything is moving at, like with chat GPT coming out and like, (laughs) and now like everybody wants to study it and like how it's going to affect like the way we work or how we communicate. And so it's like, I would have these um, research ideas and they were still in development. And then I turn around and someone has a paper that's out that's like really similar to my idea. And so that made it extremely difficult and just the way social media has changed too with like Twitter and like the API being like ridiculously expensive. (laughs) So that has also made um, the first two years of grad school really difficult. Just like the way tech is changing so quickly. Yeah. It's really crazy. Cause I, yeah, it's just, (laughs) <laughs> I think sometimes I'm still reeling from how crazy like the Zykus changes as well. Like when we first started, there was like a particular set of things that people were interested in that mm-hmm. these tech companies were interested in and interested in hiring people for, you know? Mm. And by now it's like completely changed. And with that on what your interests were, like it kind of feels like your own value changes based on the powers that be and the people who make those decisions about what their company wants to work towards. So like sometimes people, or I've heard people, they discuss, like discuss, Oh wait, should I like make my interest include AI Mm -hmm. in some way? So I can be relevant to these opportunities. Um, And I think that's like also something to consider um, or that like, being a PhD is like, how do you want to like ride those trajectories that society just suddenly makes at certain times as well? That is a great point. I mean, you could ride the wave, right? But I think the better strategy is having a different set of skills that are transferable, right? And so maybe it's not your research topic, but you have the skill set that would allow you to do various things at different in different companies for different reasons. Right. And, and as long as you're able to articulate that, right. Cause that's half the battle being able to describe your value to a company based on what they value, what they prioritize. Um, I think that's a, that's a huge thing that we miss in graduate education is how we train advisees to describe their skills. Yeah. Yeah. And those like, transferable skills. But the the thing that I've also learned is that like all skills are not seen as equal. Like it's true. Up. <laughs> yeah. You know, like transferable skills and, you know, qualitative methods versus transferable skills and quantitative. Mm-hmm. Those are not necessarily valued the same. You know. And my background has been predominant. Like I started because of qualitative skills, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm now in the process of building those quantitative skills. And I don't know. I just like think that grad school has also just exposed me to the way in which those are not seen as equal, even though people might purport them to, might want them to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and in yeah, terms but qualitative of skills are mean, things yeah. that other people struggle with, right? Like, think about all the user mm-hmm. studies that exist. Mm-hmm. Not everybody can interview somebody. That's true. <laughs> and you need that data, right? Like, it's important data if you're developing any kind of product 
to get feedback mm-hmm. from a user base so that you can either improve or pivot or whatever with your product. So mm-hmm. it just depends. It depends. It depends. I'm a qualitative yeah. person, so I'm team. No, I feel you. Fight the fight the power. <laughs> I feel. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Like I, I love the kind of data. Mm-hmm. Um that I'm able to derive from qualitative, but I guess it's just part of like the messages that come with being in a PhD as well. That's real. That's Um, real. That like, honestly, like I didn't have these, I didn't have these thoughts about qualitative versus quantitative before really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, but then I get haters to a PhD and I'm like, Oh my yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I was just like, what? Yeah. So, yeah, people want to make themselves feel yeah. better and be like, oh, if it's not quantitative, I don't know what it is. Like, just because you haven't been trained in it doesn't make it any better or worse than any right. other method. So. Or it's not rigorous. Mm-hmm. Right. When I was at Michigan, oh, yeah. um, we did, you know, studies that needed IRBs. And people are like, oh, you work with people. You know, that must be <laughs> easy. I'm like, no, actually, I am cl- I'm trained with the same training you have. And I have this additional training. It's not mm-hmm. a, oh, I know half of one and half of the other sort of thing. So don't mm-hmm. hate or shut up. <laughs> but yeah, <it's> just, <laughs> people just want to have something to talk about, I feel like, to try mm-hmm. to differentiate. But um, one of the pieces that you said earlier, Jennifer, I think you, you unlocked the cheat code for grad school. Like, literally, don't compare yourself to other people because mm-hmm. you all do not have the same trajectory at all. Like, comparison mm-hmm. is definitely, like, the dream killer because... You can look around and like none of us get our PhDs in the same way. So it doesn't make one right or one wrong. Like we just all have our mm. paths. Mm. So beautiful. Okay. <laughs> so I, oh, oh yeah. Do you have something yeah, was, that you want to add, Koe? No. <laughs> I feel like it's already been said. <laughs> it's been said. So you are Koe at Cornell Tech in mm-hmm. New York, New York, which I always forget exists <laughs> because whenever I think of Cornell, I think of middle of nowhere, New York, Ithaca, <laughs> Ithaca. cold, frigid, frozen tundra, New York, not like fancy high skyscraper buildings and <laughs> access to whatever a metropolitan city offers you mass transportation great (laughs) food things of that nature so what is it like did you go to Ithaca and then like say "Uh uh-uh no way (laughs) uh well my advisor is based um at the tech campus so I was always supposed to be here anyway um but he recommends that people spend a year in Ithaca so I spent my first year in Ithaca and it was cute it's cute for (laughs) for a year <laughs> for a year yeah yeah, yeah. for a year yeah um and then at the end of my first year i moved to tech <clears throat> the um the tech campus is on roosevelt island which is like this little island between manhattan and queens it's really small it's like about three and a half miles around the perimeter of the island what? yeah it's super small and um the campus is on like the southern tip of the island and it's an interesting mix of students people who work for the un and young families so yeah it's a it's a good mix of people that sounds like a good mix yeah i've always wondered this you don't have to give us any numbers but do you feel like your grad student stipend is enough to sustain you in new york city which is one of the like most expensive cities to live in <laughs> I live okay, live comfortably. I mean, I have roommates. I live on campus, so mm-hmm. it's a little bit cheaper. Um, but I'm. I also don't go out often, so there's that. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I live. I live decent. I've always wondered, like, do universities try to like, you know, scale the stipend according to the cost of living? of where you are because like let's say you had like the nsf graduate research fellowship it's the same for everybody if you're in a podunk town versus you know san francisco or new york or miami so you know i feel like there needs to be more where you know just up the sliding scale yeah we need a sliding scale for some of these things yeah i will say that um my i do have like a higher stipend than students in ithaca to you know account for the cost of living 
Yeah, so that helps quite a bit. Hmm. I wondered that because Michigan is very like suburban and I was like, oh, we're good. And Florida's kind of the same way too with the low cost of living. I'm like, I don't know how I would make it. Um, I applied to like NYU and stuff. My mom was like, if you go to NYU, you're going to be broke. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, mom. (laughs) She was right. (laughs) If you went anywhere, you were going to be broke because that is the plight of a graduate student, unfortunately, in this country. In every country. What am I saying in this country? So, yeah. It's rough. It's hard out there. Yeah. But you seem to be thriving, and that's good. Um. Okay. So, what's next for you both? Let's see. I have my qualifying exam in about a month, so... Ooh, describe that process for us, because we know it's different at other at different universities. Yeah, so my advisor, he just told me to present on two studies and a rough outline of future work. So I don't have a written component or anything. It's just broad audience talk and Q&A. So he made it seem very low stakes. Uh, He's not stressed about it. So I tell myself I shouldn't be stressed about it. (laughs) But uh, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still stressed. (laughs) I mean, it's a major milestone. You know, you can't just walk in like, oh, yeah, my advisor said I shouldn't be stressed. You know, <laughs> there's going to be some element of, you know, of stress. Like, you may not be as stressed as someone who's, you know, making it a super anxious thing. But, you know, mm-hmm. it's, if your advisor is like, you got it, you know, you should have some confidence going into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I guess I'm excited to celebrate all that I've accomplished or learned in the last two years or so and uh, present it towards or present it in front of my committee. So looking forward to that and just hearing their thoughts on areas to improve or um, just potential avenues that I could go. So is this like a combined like proposal too? Because like for us, our quals is like, what is what's have what has been done in the area? Um, that's how Florida does it. Like basically, you know, give us a survey of the area you want to go into. So we know, you know what you're talking about. Um, at Michigan, we did, um, we just presented like a conference worthy paper for our quals, but yours has this extra element of like, what do you want to do in the future as well? So, uh, do some of those elements go into your proposal or is this kind of like a combined thing? I guess it's a bit of combined, like I'm presenting on a paper that I have at Kai and then also just a rough outline of what Come I on, want Kai to paper. do. She just dropped that in there. Yeah. Just like, you know, just this little Kai paper. Y'all, look it up. C-H-I. They have one of the lowest acceptance rates. They're very highly regarded. Don't be just dropping that in there. Like, <laughs> yeah, I just wrote something on some loose leaf. And like, you better Carrier celebrate. Carrier pigeoned it to my advisor. Yeah, now I see why your advisor is like, you got this. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, I guess, the outline for my qualifying exam, just the paper and some next steps. Mm, nice. So fancy. So fancy. What about Jennifer, you, Jennifer? are you fancy? <laughs> She's very fancy. Oh. Tell us more. No. <laughs> um, I guess, like, even within the program, like, the A exam or qualifying exam is different even between students. So my quali- my qualifying exam is not really about any papers that I've done. It's sort of like, if you think of like a video game, it's like this opportunity for like me to like level up on certain skills um, that my committee members have specialty in. So, so with my advisor, he is mainly like, policy and critical data. So I'm, I'm with him, I'm learning about statistics and critical ways of viewing statistics and like the history behind why certain statistical methods were developed or how they have been applied and the implications they've had in terms of um, societal effects. Hmm. Um, so I'm exploring that with him um i'm also interested in content like digital labor and identity and creativity so i'm still developing what i'm with brooke duffy 
who is prominently known for uh, work related to uh, content creators. Um, so I am possibly exploring ways of, you know, how maybe generative AI has impacted the work um, of content creators or the ways in which generative AI has contributed to the har harassment and harm of them. So those are part um avenues I could go. And then with like my last advisor, um, Steve, Steven, um, I will actually be looking at, so one thing is that I'm looking, so since I was like, I'm writing this book, uh, and it kind of- Wait, 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 uh-uh, nope. <laughs> since I'm writing this book, what book? Right. Y'all just be dropping stuff in there like, <laughs> you know, I was going to the store and I happened to write a book. Anyway, I got oranges, <laughs> I got. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I am writing a speculative fiction book. I started it during the pandemic, like the height of the pandemic. And I was really interested in dating apps mm -hmm. and how I think like from, a, from my background, H, like H, I was looking at the design of it and I kept seeing like glitches. And then I, I started like thinking, oh, what if like these glitches were like a portal to like a different world or to like certain beings to like enter our lives in some way, I guess, which is like actually what a dating app is supposed to do on a literal way True. but i was just like okay but let's make it spooky um, <laughs> but some of that be spooky too so <laughs> um so i just like ran with that and i started like writing like i wrote my first manuscript and right now i'm on like my first draft my fourth draft mm -hmm. um i am hoping to publish it at some point i have raised money for it over two thousand dollars Wow. Um, I've built a newsletter um, of people who are interested in seeing this book come out at some point. <laughs> but I'm also using it as like taking inspiration from other like Black speculative writers like Octavia Butler uh, and Kay Jemison and the way they use speculative fiction as a way to imagine new futures for herself i was curious about like what do what would our digital futures look like as well and so mm. i kind of just went with this like fun idea of a haunted um a haunted ai driven um dating app and it's also queer so the main character is a black woman and she meets like another um being let's say um <laughs> on the date on the dating app as well and so they kind of, they're going through it. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, but, I need to read but, this. <laughs> I want to watch the movie. But, but, like, it sounds like a cool movie, actually. Netflix, where you at? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, real. Um, but I'm using, I'm using this book, the work of other, like, past um, Black speculative fiction writers, um, I am also looking at the literature and kind of integrating all of them, um, to write an author's note, um, to see like how they relate to each other and how they speak to each other. So that's what my, what I'm doing with the, um, my last committee member. So they so all cool. come together in some way. I'm still mm -hmm. trying to figure out why, but how, um, there, there's a point. <laughs> but I'm using my uh, A exam as a way to like explore these different themes together and to develop reading lists where I just read a lot and write a lot and finally present the result of that work probably in August. Um, Very cool. To have made it. Yeah, keep exam. us posted. Uh, so, yeah. Please keep us posted because mm -hmm. we have some really cool yeah. stuff going on. Yeah, I know we mentioned the book in your bio, but it's not the same as you like giving us all the details. So, had to ask. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So, Koei, what are you, what is your research focused on? Because you didn't really share about that, so I want to make sure you get a chance to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So my research 
very broadly looks at how different people interact with technology and how we can design more inclusive technology. Uh, yeah, very high level. That's what I do. Um, I think I'm interested in, I guess, auditing and evaluation methods for new technologies, specifically LLMs. And I'm also really interested in exploring how developers think about things like inclusion and identity as well. So that's like a high level overview of what I do. Very cool. Are there any like specific methodologies that you're interested in engaging in for your work? I want to say one thing I really want to do, and I still haven't figured out how to do it, like an actual field study. Cause I Ooh. think a lot of the work I've done previously is like very, uh, in the lab. And I want to see how people, you know, use them like in real life. Uh, yeah. But I have not figured out a good way to do a field study yet. Like collect some observational data of people like engaging in that kind of work. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, I know France does some cool stuff with like, it's almost like anthropology where you're like observing <laughs> people in the wild, you know doing what they do. She's at Intel and I know she does like work with, I believe content creators and how they use various pieces of software, but you can't interrupt the process. You can't say, oh, now come to the lab and do your workflow. It's like, no, I have to mm -hmm. observe you mm -hmm. doing your thing. So definitely connect you if you're uh, interested in some of those methodologies. She was a guest in, was it last season? Season before? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I'd love that. Oh my God, that'd be great. Yeah, she's we're all so about cool. connections over here. She's she's too cool for all of us. Like yeah. I don't even know why she talks to us. She's too cool. I don't know either. She's <laughs> she's our fancy uh, friend. Yeah, <laughs> I look so fancy. okay. Galentines, you know, people do those days or whatever. They have their little parties. Not France. <laughs> <laughs> the party France was at. I was like, whose wedding is this? It was right. it was that it was level beautiful. of was beautiful. fabulous. So you know, whatever. We're not worthy. It's okay. We love you, France. Hey, France. Yes. And then there was one other person. Uh, is it? Uh, oh, my gosh. Danae Ford. She's oh. at Microsoft. And she does work where she observes developers and, like, various uh, dynamics with developers and new people going into that community. So, um, yeah, I would say, like, between the two of them, I feel like they would be good resources for, you know, what you're trying to do. And they can tell you. I know a lot of her uh, Danae's stuff, she looked at, like, Stack Overflow um oh. for some of these things so mm -hmm. yeah we can put you in contact with them to you know maybe have a conversation and bounce some ideas mm -hmm. yeah no that'd be great i think i met danae at kai a few years ago oh, like nice. microsoft was hosting like a dinner for like black scholars so i met her there oh, but yeah so you already know her so just hit her up like hey let's talk <laughs> yeah you can blame us for why you're reaching yes. out okay perfect <laughs> jeremy and kyla said right <laughs> Awesome. So I guess like our, our last real question is like, where do you see yourself? You've got your PhD and you're doing your dream job. Where, where are you? What are you doing? Well, I don't see myself doing one thing. So right. that's fine. <laughs> Nobody puts baby in the corner. <laughs> so I guess being an, in, an industry researcher for a few years and then being a patent attorney, maybe doing some sort of independent consulting work with like, I understand like the legality of the technology. I understand how to d like develop and build it. So I think that'd be really powerful for consulting and providing business solutions, but uh, we'll see. Mm, providing business solutions for a company or like for everybody, like a Coursera course might do. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <clears throat> I have a Coursera course that I forget about. <laughs> uh, yes, I have a course on algorithmic fairness. It's meant to be accessible for everybody. So there's no coding required. Um, I believe my PI's grandmother has taken the course and she's oh, in her 90s. So that's cool. That's really amazing. <laughs> and she loved it and said Aww. it was very informative so you know if she can do the course anybody can uh mm -hmm. i love that yes. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot but <laughs> i had to get it in there somehow yes but yeah the i think the title of the course is practical steps for building fair ai algorithms um or you can just google coursera algorithmic fairness and it should show up mm. yep and we'll include it in the show notes as well 
Jennifer. Where do I see myself? <laughs> I was hoping to be, I was hoping to be working in the industry. Mm -hmm. Um I am also hoping by then I am a pub well, I'm technically already a published poet, but I would like to be as well. I that's something I would like to continue in conjunction with um working as an industry researcher, but also myself as eventually working in some way with government hmm. uh, to inform um, technology policy as well. Um, that is also something, or like working with in the think tank, I think that's also something I've been considering. I love that's that. That's really cool. Do you know that uh, AAAS has like a science and technology policy fellows program where um, basically they take scientists with PhDs and put them in different uh, organizations to do exactly what you're saying. Like I've known a lot of people who've gone through it and they have jobs I didn't know existed. So I'm like, y'all yep. got the cheat codes. <laughs> yep. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. I would love to, to see that. Um, yeah. It's yeah, uh, that sounds helpful. it would definitely be really cool. She get exposed to a lot of stuff and, you know, get the inside mm -hmm. information on different agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Kyla and I are definitely huge um, proponents of you don't have to be one thing, right? Like we're definitely not mm. confined or constrained by being professors in any way. I mean, you're on our podcast right now, which has right. nothing to do with our day jobs. <laughs> um, and then when we are most free, I think she's dancing somewhere yes. and I'm singing somewhere. So... Correct. Yeah, we're we're different. <laughs> we need to do oh. a performance. We should. I sing. I sing a song for oh, you, girl. Yes. Right now? I no, not it. right now. No, not now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying at some point in the, the future, words. you were like, "I'm singing." She's dancing. I'm like, "That sounds like a show." Actually. Maybe I'm playing the violin too. Uh. Maybe there's a transition, and we got a song. You know, like you never it. know. I like it a lot. We'll save mm. that for the live show. I love it. <laughs> I like it. Let's do it. Let's make it work. Well. Aww. Ladies, it this has been an absolute pleasure yes. getting to know a little bit more about both of you. Oh, well, thank you for having us. I'm I'm so excited. Like, this is not something that I would usually do, but I'm so happy to be here. Oh, yeah, well, we're, we're happy to. She doesn't here. hate me. <laughs> she doesn't. Oh my hate gosh. Me. <laughs> this yes. is kind of low stakes. I I would hope that she wouldn't hate you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm also just joking. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's possible, but it seems like she's happy over there. I mean, all smiles. If it's not said, it's not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love you. <laughs> so before we go, we always want people to be able to find our guests. How can they find you on the interwebs? Uh, I guess my name is pretty searchable. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of co-ways. Uh, so that's K O W E. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just... Not... Jennifer. Oh, there's probably not a lot of Jennifer Otionos as well. Um, but I have my personal webs. Well, I have my website that I have for, um, like my academic website it also has like a little blog so sometimes i like drop things there um mm -hmm. that oh. are relevant about like if i want to blog about like my um my academic journey or things that i'm reading um and you're interested in that you can probably subscribe in some way to that um and keep in touch through that i have my linkedin i um I do have a Twitter that I use as well. It's the at J I H O E M A um, handle for Twitter. Uh, and I, I think that that's generally what I use for social media um, or ways to access me. So yeah, yeah. I am definitely open. 
Nice. Awesome. We have linked the things in the show notes so <laughs> they can, so that our listeners can find you. All right. Thank yeah. You. Oh, yeah. And I probably have the newsletter for my book. Oh, yeah. We'll make sure <laughs> that that's that yeah. as well. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a sub stack. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>